Okay, so welcome to this next video on the PI3 Kinase AKT mTOR pathway. So, so far what we've seen is how when a growth factor comes and binds to a growth factor receptor, uh, that causes the growth factor to change receptor to change conformation and the growth factor receptors then dimerize together to make a growth factor receptor dimer here. Autophosphorylation then occurs where uh, the opposite growth factor receptors phosphorylate each other's um, tyrosine residues. These uh, phosphorylated tyrosine residues then lead to the recruitment of the, uh, of the phosphoinositide free kinase or PI free kinase. PIP free, ki free kinase uh, then uh, begins converting a usual component of the phospholipid by there, namely PIP2 or phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate into phosphatidylinositol 3,4,5-trisphosphate or PIP3. So that's the stage we've got to so far. We have created this PIP3 in our cell membrane and now what we need to do is see what does PIP3 do. And in fact, just before we do that, I want to discuss the fact that there is also an enzyme catalyzing this reverse reaction here, i.e. Um, which takes the phosphate group off the uh, PIP3 molecule and, um, and um, returns it back to uh, PIP2. And therefore, if you do the opposite to what uh, PI3 kinase does, you... Rev you if PI3 kinase promotes growth, and that we're going to find out that it does, you know, because when growth factors arrive at the cell, PI3 kinase activity goes up and PIP3 goes up, and that's going to carry the intracellular the signal onwards to cause growth of the cell, then this opposite enzyme is going to... Um, it's going to stop growth, basically, so it's, it's a, or oppose cell division. So it's actually a tumor suppressor gene, and it's uh, known as P10. And indeed, you do occasionally see loss of function mutations in P10 in uh, cancer. Okay, and uh, P10 stands for phosphatase and tensin homologue. Phosphatase and tensin homologue. And basically, it's called, cool, well, it's a phosphatase because it removes the phosphate group from PIP3 to convert it back into um, uh, PIP2. Don't worry about why it's called and a tensin homologue. That just explains uh, why why it's got P10, basically, why its name is P10. Tensin is a certain type of protein domain. If you want to look that up, you, you're free to do so. Right, so that enzyme reverses the signal. It turns it back off, basically, because so far we've seen that when growth factor arrives, it causes PIP3 levels to go up in the cell membrane, and that's going to carry the uh, signal further on. Okay, so let's see how it carries the signal further on then. So, uh, let's say it, this is our phospholipid bimer here now. And we now have uh, these PIP3 molecules in our, um, in our cell membrane. So let's draw some of them because we're going to need them because they're what are certain enzymes are now going to come and bind to these, basically. Okay, so let's draw them out again. So here is our inositol here. And here are our free phosphate groups here. Okay, right, so let me just colour everything in. So here's uh, uh, the glycerol here in, in green. Here are the um, long chain carboxylic acids or free fatty acids, which are esterified to the first and second hydroxyl groups of the glycerol molecule. Here's a phosphate, here's a phosphate, here's a phosphate, here's a phosphate. And uh, then we've got the inositol in the middle there. Right, okay. So, that is a PIP3 uh, molecule that is now in the cell membrane, and we've seen how this, the number of these is going to go up in response to a cell being uh, stimulated by growth factor receptor. By growth factor, rather. Okay, uh, so, uh, what's going to happen is that a certain enzyme is going to come and bind to this PIP3, okay, and it's going to be activated by this PIP3. Okay, so what is this enzyme called? Well, it's called um, uh, phosphoinositide-dependent kinase. So this is phosphoinositide-dependent kinase. And it's specifically phosphoinositide-dependent kinase 1. Phosphoinositide-dependent kinase 1. 
So it's activated by binding to this PIP2 within the membrane. And I should also mention that it's often abbreviated to P for phosphonosatide, then D for dependent, K for kinase 1. So if you see PDK1, that refers to phosphonosatide dependent kinase 1. Okay, what colour should I draw it in? I'll colour it in orange. Or outline it in orange. I don't want to really colour that massive great thing in. Okay, and it's basically a kinase enzyme that is going to activate another kinase enzyme. And the second kinase enzyme also is recruited to the membrane by binding to another PIP3 molecule. So let's say we've got PIP3 over here, another PIP3 molecule in this membrane. So um, the PIP3 kinase is at work. It's converting the PIP2 in the membrane to PIP3. So you get lots of different PIP3 molecules in the membrane. So you've got lots available for enzymes now to come and bind to. Okay, so I'll colour this one in as well. Okay, so here's our glycerol in green, our long chain carboxylic acids in orange, our uh, inositol in blue here, this six membered carbon ring with hydroxyl groups coming off every carbon, and these phosphate groups here, one that's linked to the third hydroxyl group of glycerol, and these other three coming off the third, fourth, and fifth carbons of um, the inositol. Right, okay, so another enzyme is going to come and bind to this PIP3, uh, but it's not activated by the PIP3, it just binds to it. So the, a uh, the PDK1 uh, bound to the uh, PIP3 and that was actually activated by it, whereas this next one is just going to bind there, but it's not going to be activated by uh, the PIP3, so it's just recruited to the cell membrane by the PIP3, basically. Okay, and this is a famous enzyme now. This is um, AKT. So this is the one that uh, the, path the pathway is also named after. One of the three that the pathway is named after. And AKT has another name. Uh, it's also sometimes called protein kinase B. Its old name is uh, AKT. Its more modern name is protein kinase B. B. So it's sitting alongside protein kinase A and protein kinase C in its importance, and protein kinase G if you want. Um, but um, it's often still referred to, you will see it, it's very pervasive in the medical literature to see it referred to as AKT. And that's the name that it was given, I believe, because of the mice that it was discovered in. Uh, I think that's where that name came from. Okay, but um, it's not important where the name came from. That's, that's what it's called. But uh, how is this going to be activated then now? So it's been recruited to the membrane by binding to PIP3. Well, what happens is this enzyme is an active kinase enzyme now. And it's also at the membrane. Now, both at the membrane, this one is active. So what it does is it phosphorylates uh, the AKT, or the protein kinase B, and I should, note it, uh, should also tell you that protein kinase B is often uh, reduced down to a three-letter acronym too. It's often uh, written PKB. Okay, so basically, uh, PDK1, or phosphonosatide kin uh, dependent kinase 1, is going to add a phosphate group onto uh, the protein kinase B enzyme, or the AKT enzyme. And that now is going to activate our AKT enzyme. It's going to activate our protein kinase B. Right, now protein kinase B is going to carry out the next stage of uh, this signaling pathway. But before, I think it's better, before we look at what protein kinase B actually specifically does, I think it's now better to talk about mTOR now. So to jump a bit, talk about mTOR, and then we'll talk about the pathway by which protein kinase B, or AKT, actually interacts with mTOR, because it's not trivial, basically, how uh, protein kinase B uh, interacts with mTOR, and um, and a, a lot of it is still not known. So we'll, we'll do that bit later, and we'll firstly talk about mTOR. So mTOR stands for, well, <laughs> everyone still calls it the mammalian target of rapamycin, but officially now it shouldn't be called that. Uh, officially now, um, mTOR instead stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. 
Okay, so I will give both of those names. So mammalian target of rapamycin, that's what everyone will call it still, but really it now stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin. So if you're being pedantic, mechanistic target of rapamycin is what mTOR actually stands for. Okay, the other thing to say is that mTOR does not uh, just work on its own anymore. It has a whole bunch of partners in crime, basically, now, which form a great big complex with it. And there are actually two of these complexes that are important in cells. Uh, in our pathway, we're only going to focus on a single complex. We're going to talk about the mammalian target, or, oh, sorry, I, I'm guilty of it now, the mechanistic target of rapamycin complex 1, which is called the mTORC1. So this stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin, which I'll just denote as mTOR, and then complex 1. Okay, so this is a whole bunch of proteins that all go around together, basically. And let me talk about what the actual structure of this is. Okay, so that at the centre of the complex is mTOR. The mechanistic target of rapamycin is a protein, and it is at the centre of the mechanistic target of rapamycin complex 1. However, there are a bunch of other proteins uh, which are also important in this complex. So we'll draw one here. OK, now this one has quite a cool name. It's called a raptor. OK, and uh, this raptor stands for, so where should I write this? Raptor stands for the regulatory associated protein of mTOR. Okay, so the regulatory associated protein of mTOR. Regulatory associated protein of mTOR. Right, so raptor forms uh, an important uh, member of the mTOR uh, complex 1. Uh, another example of an important protein uh, which um, is part of this complex is a protein known as MLST8. Um, so MLST8. And uh, this stands for um, mammalian lethal with SEC13 protein 8. So this is a um, quite a long name. So this one stands for mammalian lethal with SEC18 protein, uh, lethal um, with SEC18 protein 8, sorry, with SEC13 protein 8, SEC13 protein 8. So that's what MLS, and I don't know where they get the T from, uh, but uh, maybe protein there, uh, 8 stands for. So that's the MLST8, uh, which also forms part of this uh, mammalian target of rapamycin. Okay, uh, another important uh, member of this uh, mTOR complex 1 is a protein known as DEPTOR. Okay, DEPTOR down here. And uh, DEPTOR stands for the domain containing mTOR interacting protein. Okay, so this stands for... Oh, is this still in view? Okay, so this stands for the domain containing mTOR interacting protein. Domain containing mTOR interacting protein. mTOR interacting protein. Okay, and then finally, there is another one uh, which is called PRAS40. PRAS40, which binds to Raptor, basically, in this great complex. So PRAS40 is bound to Raptor. Okay, and that overall now is the mammalian target of rapamycin complex 1. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to digest that, and then we'll uh, move on and talk about how uh, it is that protein kinase B, or AKT, comes to activate this protein.